All right, we're we going to go ahead and start. This is John Eich in Rochester eBuilders. Welcome to our first webinar. I, I refuse to use the term new normal because I hope this is just the temporary situation we find ourselves navigating through, or at least that's the way I'm phrasing it. <laughs> um, so on behalf of Rochester Builders, welcome, and I'd like to thank the city of Rochester uh, for participating in this webinar as we have our, continue our discussions on the sanitary sewer master plan. Uh, I have uh, Matt Crawford will be presenting with the uh, City of Rochester. He's the project manager. If you have questions, uh, you can either send them through the chat or through the questions uh, if you're logged on through the web. Uh, if you're on your phone, uh, like Jeannie, I think you, you can text me. If you can't, if you don't have the ability to ask a question, go ahead and text me. Uh, you have my cell phone. And uh, with that, I will turn it over to Mr. Crawford. Thank you. Now, this is Matt Crawford, the um, project development manager for the city and then the project manager for this project, along with Ben Fulton, our sanitary system supervisor. Um, this has been about a two year process to get the sanitary sewer master plan done. I'm going to kind of zip through the the whys and how we came we did this master plan and kind of what the end results are. I know some of the end results are what people really want to talk about. So um, bear with me as you work our way through there. And like I said, it sounds like you can just you know click uh, chat there and add ask questions as we go, and I'll try to answer them as as we get to certain spots. So Back in 1973, they did a, a sewer master study then, too, at, the, at that time. And I'm putting these in there kind of build up some of the history of why we're doing what we're doing today. Um, the city that you can see here was about 54,000 people and was only the size of little, you know, a little under 7,500 acres. Um, part of the interesting thing about those studies is they're trying to guess the future. So back in 1970, they thought that by 2020, the city would have, would have 172,000 people and be about the size of a little over 22,000 acres. So, and they had projects in there too that had to be done. And so they moved forward with those projects at that time based on that kind of knowledge. Well, by 1995, the city already had a area of 25,000 square acres bigger, but the population was much less than what they were expecting. But Still, we had grown greater than what the original plan had had guessed at that time. So again, this plan we did in 1990, finished in 1996, again, was looking at what did what were the needs of the city and how it was going to grow in the future. And that's the problem with these master plans is you're trying to guess what's going on. And so it had a list of projects to do that would meet this plan's requirements. Now, it was guessing by about 2015. We'd have 87,000 people in about an area of a little over 42,000 acres. Um, by 2045, they thought the population might by then reach almost 107,000 people. So we had actually outgrown this plan. And so that's why we had to do an update and do this 2020 plan because our population was already greater than they thought that was gonna be 2045. And again, our area had surpassed what they thought was going to be the, the area for that 96 master plan. So learning from this, one of the things we had to look at was what will the city actually serve in the future? Um, the past plans kind of built to what they thought the future was going to be, but that means we put pipe in the ground that doesn't, wasn't always sized for the long term. They had to be replaced. So in this master plan, one of the things we looked at was what would be the gravity sewer build out for the city of Rochester? We're lucky the city of Rochester is kind of like a bowl. So everything kind of flows down into town and then we go up north along the zone road to where the wastewater plant is. So taking that an advantage that we don't have to deal with lift stations and the cost of the maintenance to do that, we can create a quite a large gravity system. So in this master plan, we looked at what's the ultimate boundary, be it like ge geographical or in some cases, maybe just ultimately what would make sense to develop. In some areas, we could go way out east for quite a ways, but just I don't see us happening. And, and about the end of the West Zombro is about where the agreed line is with Byron. So we looked at different areas. That's what came up with these different, you can see the different colors on the screen here for each one of these, we call sewer sheds. And um, this, that's each has their own main trunk system all going downtown and up along the river. So we looked at what we can serve. That was the big thing. And you see on the notes here was, 86,000 square acres, gross acres of land that we could potentially develop. And um, 
we kind of use that for the basis. Okay, now we decided what we can serve. So that makes our design income important. We also used the 2018 comprehensive plan that was already in place when we were doing this. And that kind of put what zoning thought areas are going to grow based on uh, existing services and ability to, to grow and utilities and roadways, et cetera. And if you look on this, mainly the yellow is near term, the green is long term, but those are really the, what the comp plan says should develop next. The orange and pinks and reds are lo much longer out time frames. So our sewer plan at least looked at this too to see you know where growth might happen or where the comp plan wanted growth to occur. Uh, sizing of our pipes was based on really just looking at, I'll get more into that, but just analysis of all growth in those areas. We didn't really you know, consider putting pipe just for the limited, but again, the ultimate. Um, did that, and then the next phase we did too, we're looking at the comp plan is we did an existing hydraulic model of our current sanitary sewer trunk line system. And on that, we're, we're using a 25 year, 24 hour storm event for our peak discharges. This map is a little hard to see, I know, um, but anything that's not green is starting to surcharge. Yellow is slightly surcharged, orange is almost full pipe, two full pipe, and then the, the red on here is really when we're getting surcharged pipes. So as you noticed, a lot of the older sections more in the core are surcharging currently during a 25 year storm event. Um, so, our existing system works fine today, but we have limitations. More to the north, and especially northwest and northeast, we have additional capacity, but areas from, you know, the center of town down south where we have already have bottlenecks. So, we use this information to help how we're going to do our analysis for the new plan. So, we had our starting point. I'll kind of give you a zoom in here what we found. So, here again, this is going out to West Zombro, Long Highway 14. You kind of see that hash marks as the tracks. So you can see where some of the bottlenecks right now we have with just the existing conditions. And as we look at models, we added more flow to it. Obviously more of those green lines turn red. Pretty much, we don't have a lot of additional capacity left in the system for any development outside what, what's already been annexed into the city and already on, current on uh, currently on city sewer. Now from that modeling, we start looking at what kind of projects need to be be done to get it out to the ultimate development. This is an example of a map. If you look into the details, you know, there's a lot of information that master plan is we had to collect a lot of data to do this analysis. These maps tell us what size of pipe currently are, are out there for the existing ones and then what size it needs to be. If you look along that tracks, oh, my mouse will show up with this line here, you're looking at increasing this to a 36 inch sewer. So we got a 21 now, needs to be a 36, a 21 back up to a 36, et cetera. These are what pipes we need for the ultimate development. And it shows us what the existing pipes are. The dash lines out here are the extensions. Those are what needs to be extended beyond our current system to get out to the end of those. So more or less, if you're looking at this from a developer standpoint, you can see what, how many pipes what sizes need to be brought out to get to your property someday. So it kind of gives you an idea, this is our, our, our roadmap to what we need to do for projects and where we need to upsize and where we need to do extensions. And these are just trunk lines, so it's like 12 inches and larger. It doesn't include the small laterals that come out in all the subdivisions for all the streets. This is just getting the main trunk line to uh, nearby properties so they can extend out those smaller laterals to feed the development. So going through this as an example, we did this for all the different sewer sheds. Now, how we prior to, did you know, a prioritization on those projects was we looked at what was condition of the pipes, what's were the risk of overflows or backups. Those are our big things. And if those did come up as a possibility, then we looked at some risks and benefits on this. So this, we did a large analysis, we did a matrix, and we did weighting factors for like, you know, how many acres can you develop in this parcel if you did do the sewer extension versus that parcel. So we kind of came up with a very lengthy, you could say a large spreadsheet that put that gave these points for us. So we could at least come up for each one of the, the sewer sheds, you can come up with a list of projects. And you'll see that in the master plan, you dug into that, there'll be a list of all the projects and where they scored. It would help us determine if we're gonna spend city money on projects, where would we get the best, where does, what, what is the highest priority? What needs it first? So we did that came up with a list for each one and we can combine it. And we also had to combine one for all the sewer sheds. So if we wanted just on our own, just start picking off projects, we could and know which ones we should do first. 
Um, the next thing we did too is once we had those uh, with those list of projects is the breakdown of what do we need to do for each one of those projects. So all the analysis we did, the cost estimating, how long it has to be, even in the conditions of, you know, we'll get more into here is what other projects that this should be done with to open up the most acreage. So well, you'll find that in the master plan too, breaking down every project, what has to be done in con conjunction with this to actually open up more area to develop, et cetera. And so there's a lot of detail in here. And like I said, if you really wanna dig into it, this is where the costs come up that we're gonna talk about a little bit is each one of these projects has a cost and we start adding those up together. So you're looking at, again, all the different details around here. Um, and then also, I just throw this on here too, again, this shows all the extension pipes we need to do tied in with the 2018 comprehensive development plan. And you can see, you know, where the air is in yellow and stuff and green, where we have to do extensions, where, the, where it matches the plan and then outside there, where we have to do. This is just kind of showing you, there's a lot of areas that we include in our plan. It's not really in the comp plan that have to be addressed. And obviously borders change and stuff. And maybe, and we have been working with um, community development group, talking about maybe re-evaluating some of this that if a sewer line has to go through like here through a long term to get to a near term, well, maybe this should be considered actually near term too, so that it makes sense. So we're extending our sewers through areas that are in the near term to get to the long term and not having to bypass areas. So we are working on making some modifications to this as we go forward. Now we'll get to the things everybody wants to talk about. Um, so I went through the comments we got in our poll survey and. And also Megan has shared some comments with us that from she's talking with uh, John and others. And like, for example, they wanted to compare rates of current rates to what the future rates would be for a parcel of land. This is our current list of, of different rates we have for the city for sewer. Um, and they were broken down, generally speaking, by projects done already and then they, they would change the rates. So you can see the kind of the base sewer rate of 3000 per acre. What they did then was as we did additional expansion projects currently then we would have to make a new rate for whatever got benefited by that area. We, we would then we come up with like for the 18th Avenue Southwest District 5000 or out on Kings Run east of 60th Avenue they have a different than west of 60th Avenue. And these were based on actual construction costs for some of the expansion projects we were already working on. But the problem with this too is we come up, we'll come up with a new number for every different zone in town as we expand. And that's not really easy to man maintain or, or manage both from the city standpoint. And the bigger thing I wanted to show on here too is the downstream capacity number that was included in those, in those SAC rates. It was only $1,200. This was based back in that 95 report. So we haven't increased or changed that since that report, except for doing annual increases for interest. That's about it. And all those projects are done. And that number was for that. We're beyond that existing project list. So we're trying to pay for future projects already or current projects that are beyond the 96 master plan with that number. So we're already behind the eight ball when it comes to financing. We're already using uh, city utility funds that weren't intended necessarily for trunk expansion, expansion to do that. So, the approach we came up with was one, we had to look at what are all the costs that we're gonna do to do projects. So these numbers here you're seeing pop up on here, these are all the costs associated with upsizing the pipes that are currently undersized and for all the extensions of the trunk lines out to the ultimate service area. So this is what we need to pay in current dollars, you would say, for everything in those sewer sheds to be done to make it 100% developable. We then look, we also looked at what is developable in each one of those zones. So we looked at general, um, our standard, you say formulas for developable land. Not everything in an area is 100% developable, we know that. And it comes down to about 48% of all available lands ends up being developed. And that's, that's held true pretty good throughout the city. So it's a good standard. We also used uh, flow rates our flow rate analysis was based on the similar kinds of development. So a kind of similar mix of commercial and residential will be seen in adjacent areas to come up with these with a flow rate. So anyway, this came up with how many developable acres we had in that area that, that will benefit from those projects. So what we were looking at is one is, 
okay, this is how much money per acre we have to make just to pay for the new improvements that we're gonna be putting in for that sewer shed. And that's, and then the final number here is, we've already made some improvements in those areas. So there was existing balances that we're trying to collect back through the current SAC rates and connection charges to pay for those projects. I want to kind of go to a new process or don't have as much confusion to make it more simple. So we, we did pull those outstanding balances and add it back into each one of those sewer sheds. So this comes down to is the last number you see on the screen is the numbers that we, we have to collect per developable acre. So this is end story is that this is how much money we need to bring sewers out to the additional um, sewer sheds expanding. Now, how we pay for that, yes, that becomes the question. What is what is the different methods? Um, a lot of people had concerns about that. Um, well, did we look at other options? And yes, I actually talked to you know uh, other groups that worked with communities, and it's pretty much there's no uniform standard answer. It's all over the board. From 100% developer pays for it, and with acreage costs similar to ones we see on our screen, very high ones, and to some were. Communities are actually, you know, desperate for growth. So yes, uh, they use more of their city funds, which is either tax levy or utility funds to help subsidize these projects. And so when we looked at this, our current system right now today handles our sewage, sewage needs. So that we don't need to expand or increase our pipe capacity for existing systems. Um, the pipes are in pretty good shape. And like I said, we're looking at this, we're looking at pipes probably lasting, the best ones are put in today too, 100 years potentially or longer. So these are long-term pipes, so they don't need to be replaced that often. And there's some maintenance we can do. And all the maintenance, all that kind of work we do on them right now, all does come out of our, our city utility, our sewer utility. So that's what pays for the ongoing maintenance. So that's already being done by a different fund. So that's not included. This is just, again, new infrastructure. So we looked at that. Um, historically, the city hasn't used tax levy to pay for development costs. It's been really paid for by through developers and, and sometimes, you know, with the city with utility fees collected. Um, but in this case, everybody downstream has already been paying and that utility money is really for maintenance. Um, and they paid their construction costs for the pipe. So to put that burden back on the existing uh, property owners, we didn't think it was necessary a fair way to do this. And so we looked at the people that are gonna benefit from these projects should be the ones paying for the project. So you know, there was a lot of discussion about that. I know a lot of it has to go with developing process and yes, it will make some of these areas more expensive to develop than others. But again, we looked at it, that's a cost ratio of, we still have to get, you know, for, you know, for the Southwest or South Zumbro, where the school was talking about putting land, we need to get almost 38,000, over $38,000 an acre to pay for that. And who's gonna pay for that? It's always been a big question, but we kind of thought if developers wanna go in that area, they should really be the ones to help support that development. Um, and also we look into at those costs is that if the city has to subsidize this, we only have two choices for that, which is tax levy, which we have to increase tax levy then because all of our funds are currently being used or cut programs. And most residents are against that, raising their taxes. The other one is our city utility, our sewer utility, that doesn't have the cost included in that right now to do that. We'd have to ex more or less um, increase that significantly to make up any difference. Now also doing that means we won't have the funds available until the sewer, sewer utility collects enough money out of that. What we're trying to do with this fund too is with the developers paying it, it is a large amount I understand, but we're trying to get a balance built up so that we can self-fund these projects ahead of time and not wait for other uh, monies to be built up that we can use to do these projects. That puts a timeline. People are always in a hurry to get some of these projects done. If we don't have the funds and have to wait, it's going to take a while, and that does make it frustrating for some developers. Um, and we're trying to look at ways that hopefully that we can expand. And with this type of cost, we can expand in multiple areas at one time. If we have to supply the costs from another funds, that might limit to how many projects and where we can go, which might even reduce our ability to help develop certain parts of town because we don't have the money. So we're trying to find a good solution that, that solved the people who want the development to occur as fast as possible and make it we thought was relatively fair. Nobody's over 100%, I could say, happy with, you know, with costs, 
like I said, this is just the expansion. All the maintenance goes back to utility users. So all the future maintenance, any inlining and stuff like that, it comes already out of our sewer utility. So they're not paying for anything downstream that normal maintenance. This is just paying for increasing capacity. Um, one thing I want to show you too on, on is phase two is just kind of showing what happens. So East Zumbro is so large that eventually the costs change as the development moves on. Um, this I mentioned to the wastewater rate study. We're going to start doing that in 2022. So obviously, if we did different funding source, we're going to have to include that in there. Um, there is plant investment fees. Everybody has to pay when they do developments. They understand that. And then that SAC rate, which we want to change to a trunk rate. Trunk rate. Most important thing on here to show is, yeah, our current SAC rates, we're only getting, you know, 400, 800,000 a year. Most of these projects for these uh, sewer expansions to put in a significant amount that has an impact, you know, we're talking three to $4 million per project. We obviously can't get enough money from SAC current the current process to pay for this. And then, and like I said, the total revenue we're getting off SAC is pretty low. So that's not a way to, you know, officially the current SAC is not going to work, period. We're not going to do any sort of expansion that's meaningful if we're going to just stay with the current rates we got now. So we know we have to increase that to make it doable to do this project. Um, also, I just to throw on here too is just kind of our process. Like I mentioned before, you had a petition to extend sewer. They may do a feasibility and come up with a brand new number for a, a SAC rate for that area. You get the council and everybody to agree to that, and all the developers had to agree to pay for that. And usually, you wanted sixty percent of those people to be on board to start doing the project. The new process, kind of since we already have a list of all the projects and the cost, we don't need to go through that phase anymore. Mainly, is picking out a direction that the council wants development to go in that area. We can start doing a process to get those pipes expanded, especially if we know we have developers on board that are looking for that. So it makes it a little more, like I said, streamlined for us to provide additional capacity for people without having to uh, go through a lengthy process and then everybody coming in and asking, can do a feasibility, can do a feasibility. We have the feasibility done. We show how we get sewer wherever it needs to go. Obviously, we got to go piecemeal. We got to fix downstream. We got to extend to get out there. But I think this help and helps everybody understand what needs to be done to get it out to their land without having to have to guess as much anymore. So I think that's beneficial, at least from the master plan overall. I'm thinking that, yes, I am done now. So I kind of went through that quickly. So we probably should see what there's out there for questions and I can start answering some of those too. Yeah, so if you have any questions, those that are listening, uh, you can type it into the question and send it our way um, or in the chat box. I don't think there's a way for me to, but I can check and see if there's a way for me to make your phone. Up. And I know from our part, I'll keep talking while you're looking at that. There's some of the questions we got in or comments on the Polko was talking about, you know, DMC downtown versus um, additional development outside. Uh, DMC is just kind of its own special thing going on. We are doing a lot of improvements there, but the pipe we're putting in too, even through the DMC is going to allow additional capacity to flow through downtown Because everything that comes from the kind of the south and somewhat to the east flows through downtown and that goes to the, to the wastewater plant. So we are doing improvements, even though it's, it's part of DMC needs, it will open up flow for other areas. And also the DMC state funding helps pay for 50% or sometimes greater of these projects, the cost of doing that project. So um, it's a different kind of funding source for those, which would be different than the ones we're going for, for you could say out uh, outside the sewer sheds. Um, so, and how those DMC is set up, those monies can't be used outside the DMZ zone. So it's, it, it, you really can't compare DMC to out, outside the city, but we wanna do both. And we're, we're and that's why we're trying to find a funding source to make sure that can happen. Um, and I know people talk about housing and, and, and low income housing, and that's really, you know, not really part of the sewer plan. I know this will impacts on, that's more probably talking sometimes with your council person and, and the city administration about, you know, wh what's the idea for the best place for, um, you could say, uh, reasonable housing costs and stuff like that. And I look at it, the outside of the town is, the farther we get away from town, is usually more expensive for development in most areas. So it's not where you expect to find a lot of um, cheaper housing. It's more or less people are building newer, bigger houses out there and they kind of, and people are buying their first time homes inside the towns of existing of existing houses. But again, that's a policy call. That's not the master plan about it. We're just putting out to the cost, the facts, what we needed to do. Uh, 
you have any questions Matt, yet? Matt, I was just, yeah. this is, uh, hi everybody. Um, this is Wendy Turry, the um, Interim Public Works Director. Um, and the, the big thing I wanted to explain is our next steps. So what we're gonna do is we're hopeful to bring this to the council for approval uh, in uh, June 1st. And what we will do at that time is bring any comments and uh, summarize what we heard from folks here, as well as what we've heard on POCO or email. So we make sure that the council has a good understanding of what people's concerns are. All right, I'm gonna try to unmute somebody that has a question. We'll see if this works. Okay, Jeannie, you wanna give her a shout? Can you hear me okay? Yep, sure can. Okay, everybody in Ro the city of Rochester can hear me? <laughs> no, right. just, just on this webinar. <laughs> yeah, that's what I meant. So it seems like the city is putting expansion solely on the heels of new home buyers. I mean, we already pay the PIF charges, not we, the home buyer, because these costs all get paid not by the developer as everybody always says the developer has to you know take these charges and pass them on to our buyers okay how do you how does the city i mean we know we have a huge issue with workforce housing and the needs of workforce housing i don't see it ever happening with all the rate all these charges are just going to keep you know increasing 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 have you guys taken that into consideration And I'll take a first this and then you can talk at, at um, a couple of things. We, we, I, I get it. I understand it. These, some of these costs are really expensive and I get that, the, you know, ultimately the people buying the homes are the ones paying. There are some areas, as you can see, that, you know, there, are, there, there still are some areas with capacity. So there are areas where you can build homes where you cannot, you don't have to, you know, basically do any expansions and, and, um, and book into the current system. That's one answer. There are some areas that are lower to, um, that don't cost as much to add on. Um, saying that, you know, we have to think about everything. So there's people that are within the city, they are on systems that currently work. This, you know, if the system needs to be fixed because it's old, those kinds of things, they'll have to pay and that would come up through the, the sewer charge. But otherwise, you know, this is adding capacity adding size for new development. So the, the way that these are being proposed right now is that it really is who, you know, who we're doing the work for is gonna be paying for the, the cost. So you're right, there are, you know, there's areas where people can still build that aren't gonna have these higher costs, but there are, you know, that's the costs that are associated with trying to build in these areas. And we are talking about, you know, housing, that's a whole different policy thing. The charges can be what there are. Are there subsidies that the council would want to give to certain projects to make it happen? That's a possibility. That's a council decision. Um, brownfield development, you could call it, or infield development, where you take out old houses and put in, you know, apartment apartment complexes and such for workforce works. You can do that. They don't pay any of these these trunk charges, but they're putting on existing systems. So any repairs done in those areas are all coming off the, generally speaking, be off our utility um, costs. So, so I mean, there's different options to meet, make make that happen. You know, does that can everybody go buy a brand new home right away as their first home? Probably not. Not in these zones we're talking about now. It might be a little outside some of those ranges, but yeah. And that's more of a policy thing, I guess, for the you know the council. And if you subsidize one project, do you subsidize them all? And then again, like Wendy mentioned, then we're putting that burden on the existing taxpayers or the existing utility users that already paid for their system to pay for somebody else's. Now. Doesn't mean they can't do it, but we didn't think that at this time was fair, and that's what we're how we're approaching this. Um, I see there's a panelist question there that's asking: Do we know how much the sewer utility fee would be would have to increase to make up a portion of the increased costs? I'm going to let Matt answer or see if I know we looked at this a little bit, um, but I don't know that we've got the exact number. Um, it would be different in every spot, right? You can see there's some areas that are don't cost as much to upsize as others. And do you remember we look at what this would be? But it, it was it was substantial. I know that. Yeah, I mean, it, it all depends again on how much you know. What's what's a subsidized rate? Are you paying 10, 20, 50 percent of that cost? 
and each one of those just in increases the rate. And we already know that the existing utility rates not enough to maintain what we have right now. So it's already going to increase just to maintain the wastewater plant in our existing collection system. And then you're going to be throwing whatever portion on top of this. I mean, and if we haven't looked at those numbers, no, because it just all depends on which we want to go to. And it will be a lot. And that's it will be a lot more than it is now and people will be shocked. I mean if it went up fifty percent, that'd be a lot. And I really could see if we had to start trying to fund it through utilities, you could usually see a jump of that much. All right, uh, Jeannie had a follow-up uh, question. You should be good to go, Jeannie. So my question is, you said there is capacity in areas for building workforce housings. Are you, are housing, are you talking about infill? Yes, we're talking about infill or, or the areas that are already existingly on the existing system that we've already modeled in, we call the existing system that you could do some of that in there, yes. Yeah, but infill is not affordable. It just doesn't work for affordability. I look at my Pebble Creek subdivision that, you know, we try to keep things affordable, but now my sewer rate, my SAC charges are gonna go from, you know, $4,200, $4,300 an acre to eleven six. You yep. know, I, I just feel like, and everything that we try to do or the city tries to do, they put the burden solely on the new homeowner, which I really believe that growth benefits the entire community. It just doesn't develop, it just doesn't benefit the new person. The entire community actually benefits from growth. But the council is so apprehensive by you know increasing rates because that's their constituents that's their voters they're not going to get voted in there maybe if they have to raise rates and i just don't think that's fair i don't think it's fair for new people coming into rochester i think this is going to be a huge growth stopper in rochester you're not going to see people going in some of these areas because it's just not you're not going to be able people aren't going to be able to afford to do it i think you're going to you know cut your nose off to spite your face Thanks, Jeannie. Well, some of these costs did match up with our kind of what the, the comprehensive plan showed. So there is that we want growth to occur because the utilities are cheaper, the roads are in better shape. It kind of matches that. That was one of the things is that, you know, like out on, you know, King's Run, it is, you say 11,000, but that's specifically different than 24,000 for the Northwest Territories or 38 for the South Zumbro. Um, and so it, it kind of does match up where development should go. And yes, it will be more expensive, but I said other communities have had rates like this and they are still seeing development. If people want the homes, they will come and develop. It, it won't stop it because people mentioned going out to surrounding communities, Byron, Stewart, whatever, they have limited capacity too. They're gonna do the same thing we're doing once they get saturated with growth. And they will, then they'll go back and have to figure out how to pay for upsizing the pipe for additional growth, which means plant costs, trunk line costs and have to figure out is the taxes, utilities, or the, you know, the same fees we're dealing with. So yeah, you might see some jump out for a while, but they'll come back. We're, we're not gonna stop, I don't see this stopping growth. It's gonna change, yes, and potentially some of the developments. And it'll let you know too is existing platted and under agreement developments, they will pay the charges they are currently paying in, until that agreement is, is fulfilled. This is only gonna affect brand new development that's not already under existing city agreement. So this is really fresh developments is what these chargers will, will start being used on. Rick, Rick, you had some questions from some members that couldn't make the meeting. Did you want to go through some of those? I had submitted the, the one that I had and then the other, the other questions were really tied kind of to what Jeannie raised in part. And a, a, sounds like a large part of it's talking about financing mechanisms um, from previous members. Uh, the other question that I did have that, I haven't, that hasn't been asked yet is, you know, is, is there any concern about how the drastic disparity between the proposed fee increases will also affect land values in the areas that are just cheaper and kind of nullify the difference in costs when it comes to being able to develop affordably? I guess we really haven't looked at that in land costs and what how that's going to change. Um, I think it'll look at people what they want to, what they'll be selling it for for development. Because if you know the charges will be more, obviously it'll affect the land costs. But 
would help people identify what areas might be easier to develop. That's when things is going to help because in the end, the city has to collect that amount of money, no matter what, from somewhere. And the more money we have to spend out, even out of city's pocket, it's going to limit the ability for us to bring sewer to those areas, which is going to hamper development too. Let's see, has any consideration been given to revising territorial rates if when the school district builds a new school, presuming that's where housing will likely go? No, we have not. Um, again, the problem is, is the cost to bring the sewers is still the same. What you're really talking about there is trying to do some sort of subsidy because they have more housing. I, I think that's more of a, to me, I look at that, instead of trying to have that across the board, then everybody gets a, a deduct. It would be more probably, I think, a council directive at that point. If they want to help subsidize certain areas for whatever reason people agree to, they still can. These are just what we have to collect. So, I mean, ultimately, this is what you'd pay unless somebody wants to subsidize it. Um, so, and that's, I like that approach more. We let the city try to figure out where they want maybe additional things to happen versus trying to do a deduct that we have to then put on tax levy or somebody else, which again makes it difficult for us to collect enough funds to actually do the project. That's only my concern when people talk about putting a burden, but then they know what their costs are and we know how to get the project done versus putting the burden someplace else and trying to collect those funds. And we know how difficult it is to sometimes raise money. Uh, another question is, how do you handle fees for expansion resulting from orderly annexation? It, it, the fees would be the same for that as, as any. Um, and again, Already annexation really happens. I mean, I'm not, that's more of a community development, you know, question how that works, but from a sewer standpoint, um, if they want sewer, they've already asked for the projects to be paying these rates to extend sewer to that area. Um, that's how usually how that works. So it's already under an agreement before we get there. Um, so I don't, I don't see that change anything, any different for them. John, this is Cindy Steinhauser from the community development department. Um, if Hi there, sorry, I, I just wanted to chime in. Uh, we, we are currently not um, having any discussions about revisiting the current rates uh, re related to orderly annexation or other um, application uh, rates uh, in our current process. And then another question that popped up is what date should developers expect these fee changes to be implemented? Well, if it got approved at the June 1st council meeting, it would start immediately after that. So they're proposing these charges to be approved and accepted by the council on June 1st. And well, all right, well, I'd like to thank uh, uh, the crew um, from the uh, city to put together this uh, presentation. I'd like to thank everybody for taking your time. We'll be, rec this has been recorded, we'll send it out to, uh, the people that uh, missed and if there's any other questions that we didn't see um oops i think okay so uh, Jeannie had one other question uh will pebble creek new developments be affected by this increase i have a gdp uh but w does this mean every time i bring in a new phase my cost will increase i'd have to review her agreement with with mark um baker it's a good chance the entire gdp if it was included in the original agreement would be grandfathered in. If an area is added to it that wasn't part of the original GDP and try to add it to it, that would be subject to the new charges. Okay, uh, with that, uh, we will wrap it up. Thanks for participating. It was our first webinar and, and I'd like to thank Shelly in our office for uh, getting GoToWebinar set up so we're able to do this. And, and uh, watch for uh, more additional webinars as we uh, move along as needed. And uh, with that, any other comments from city? I have no additional comments. No, thanks for thanks for setting this up and making sure we could hear from folks and, and we'll make sure that we summarize what we heard. Thanks, Wendy. Thanks, Matt. Thank you very much. Megan, too. Have a good day, everybody.